This conference will now be recorded. Okay, we're ready to start. All right, so hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ACRM pandemic webinar, which is part of a series of webinars produced by ACRM and the ACRM Technology Networking Group to help bring needed information to rehabilitation researchers and providers regarding the use of telehealth during the pandemic. This webinar series is a collaboration with the BI ISIG, and we want to thank the ISIG leadership for their effort in support of this and for recommending today's speaker. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Theo Tsalcides and is entitled Moving Rehabilitation into the Future. Lessons learned from delivering an emotion regulation group intervention for people with brain injury online. Before we get started with the presentation, I do want to advise that this meeting is being recorded. I'd also like to ask all attendees to keep your phones or mics muted and keep your cameras turned off throughout the presentation. We do expect to have about 20 minutes available for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat feature and we will address as many of these as we can during the later part of the hour. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Theo Tsalcides, who's a rehabilitation neuropsychologist and clinical assistant professor in the Department of Rehab Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He serves as the training director at the Brain Injury Research Center at Mount Sinai and was the recipient of an Advanced Rehabilitation Research Training Grant from Neidler in 2010. He has been a co-investigator for the Mount Sinai Traumatic Brain Injury Model Systems and the Mount Sinai Injury Control Research Center, where he's been involved in clinical research, dissemination, and training. He has academic appointments at St. John's University in New York and Aristotle University in Greece. He is currently serving as the Interim Director of Behavioral Health at the Department of Family Medicine and Phelps Hospital, which is part of Northwell Health. His area of expertise is on interventions to improve executive functioning following brain injury. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Saltides. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. Thank you to be technology networking group for uh, inviting us and giving us this opportunity to present for the pandemic webinar series and thank you to all of you who are joining us for this webinar uh, this the work that i'm going to present to you has been funded over many years and by many different grants and i would like to thank our funders uh, primarily nidler and the cdc uh, we don't have any other uh, relationships with commercial entities, even though we use some of the commercial software available. So I'd just like to make that uh, known to you. And uh, these are the learning objectives that I have set out for you for today. I'm not going to go over them uh, in detail now, but you will see how we will address each of them as we go through the presentation. What I would like to do today is share with you some lessons that we have learned over the many years of the research that we have been conducting to help people with brain injuries improve their lives by targeting their ability to uh, improve their executive functions. So our work started many years ago uh, where we thought, as historically is uh, as known in rehabilitation, that executive functions are the foundation of, of goal-directed behavior. The implication of executive functions in any type of goal setting, a goal accomplishment, whether these are personal goals, professional goals, interpersonal goals, are critical. And they have been related to long-term rehabilitation outcomes. As a result, one of the primary targets of post-TBI rehabilitation has been improving the executive functions. Now, our targets specifically in terms of the executive functions were problem solving and emotion regulation. The reason we made that choice is that uh, we made this assumption that at the core of executive dysfunction is impaired problem solving. And impaired problem solving is further impacted by good emotion regulation skills. So if you think about it, if you have a problem and you're having difficulty solving it, 
that's going to lead to some kind of emotional reaction, right? We may get frustrated, we may get anxious, we may get angry, and this level of emotional state is not going then to facilitate good problem solving. When problem solving abilities are blocked by emotional dysregulation, that then creates new problems or it renders the remaining problems unsolved. So we thought that developing an intervention that includes aspects of problem solving and emotion regulation training is critical. So we started our work back in 2004 when we developed Executive Plus. Executive Plus is a day treatment program that is by all other standards similar to a standard comprehensive day treatment program, which is one of the gold, and gold standards of uh, post-DBI rehabilitation. But what we did to that template of standard treatment is we added two components. We added an emotion regulation component and a problem solving component. So we created two interventions. Uh, one is called SWAPS, which is the problem solving intervention, and the other is called MREG, which is the emotion regulation intervention. And we embedded these as intensive modules within the Executive Plus Day Treatment Program, while also infusing other modules with these the concepts that people learn in SWAPS and MREG. So we did a clinical trial in 2004. We started a clinical trial, five-year trial, uh, testing the efficacy of Executive Plus, comparing it to a standard day treatment program. Meanwhile, in 2007, we received funding from the CDC to develop a shorter version of Executive Plus, primarily because Executive Plus was a 26-week treatment program. Uh, it required participation five days a week, so it was pretty intensive in terms of the resources that we needed to deliver it, as well as the uh, participation commitment that the uh, patients had to make. Uh, so STEP which is actually an acronym for short-term Executive Plus, was a condensed version of Executive Plus where we maintained just the active ingredient, swaps and MREG, and delivered a three-day-a-week uh, treatment program over 12 weeks. And we did another five-year clinical trial on this intervention. And I'm not going to go into detail into these interventions. They have, the results have been published and we'll be happy to share, uh, uh, point you to where you can find more information. But what happened is that in 2012, we were done with our clinical trials. And as our interventions, as I mentioned, required intensive commitment and participation, we discovered one thing that, of course, we all know. The first lesson that we learned was that people with brain injury need access to treatment. We had often people call us and say that we, we like this treatment, we need this treatment because we believe that it's going to help us um, help family members or help ourselves or uh, somehow going to move us forward even though we have been um, out of uh, the rehabilitation arena for years. And what prevented people from coming was the fact that we were located here in New York. In fact, the red circle is probably an accurate uh, capitulation of our catchment area, which is about an hour and a half uh, drive uh, outside of New York City. Uh, but we had people call us from different parts of the country uh, wanting to know more about the treatment. But when hearing about the fact that this is a 26-week treatment or 12-week treatment, people couldn't often make the commitment because it would require traveling to New York City, staying in New York City, uh, or um, uh, which is prohibitive for many people, and or driving back and forth from a relatively shorter distance uh, but longer still than an hour and a half a day. So that would make it very, very challenging. So we started looking at the literature and we identified that systemic barriers uh, to treatment to re post TBI rehabilitation that include the fact that we don't have a plethora of adequately trained professionals. So we start with few and select people across the country who can deliver the treatment. Then most major outpatient treatment or medical centers are located in uh, major metropolitan areas or 
are spread out throughout the country and that makes it hard for people to access. They don't have proximity to the different options that they have that exist. And with limited transportation options, uh, whether that is because transit or paratransit service services are limited or because uh, they can't drive, that makes, that makes it difficult for them to get the treatment that they need. Of course, there are also individual barriers who would prohibit people from participating in treatment even if they were closer to a major treatment center, a rehabilitation center, or a research center like ours. Uh, we know that people may have a hard time leaving their home because they have pain, they have balance issues, they have sensory problems that prohibit them from being in crowded environments or in uh, brightly lit clinic rooms. Um, they may have difficulty scheduling appointments, keeping them, getting on time, and also financial constraints that may prohibit them from uh, travel, um, overnight stays perhaps, or having to buy a meal each time they go into a day treatment program. So those were some of the barriers that exist. And now we have this unexpected adverse global event like uh, the pandemic COVID of COVID-19 that has rendered most of us, uh, most of us providers inaccessible because a lot of us had to shift from being present in our clinics to being um, available remotely. So with these barriers to treatment in mind, we have to think about, well, is there a solution to that? And what can we do having built on these two, uh, on this intervention, the Executive Plus for many, many years? What can we do next? So having to answer the question, we discovered that there is a solution. It is possible to increase access to treatment using technology. Telerehabilitation is the solution. Solution and telerehabilitation is using technology to deliver a, a wide range of services, including assessment, intervention, uh, consultation to other professionals, and so on. And of course, the advantage of telerehabilitation is that it does increase access for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to get to a treatment center. It reduces transportation time and therefore fatigue um, or uh, the um, enormous burden of having to travel back and forth for a long time and it reduces the cost. Sometimes the cost both for participants or patients as well as for facilities. Brain injury rehabilitation, tele-rehabilitation research is not, uh, isn't, there isn't an abundance of studies but there is, there is quite a lot to make us think that this is a good option. In fact, Telehabilitation uh, literature can be found as far back as 2005 uh, with targeting tar uh, treatment targets like depression or emotional distress, cognitive skills, social problem solving, and independent living skills. And there are many more that have actually been published more recently. And the way in which those interventions have been delivered also varies. There are some interventions that are therapist facilitated, which means that there is a therapist present and there is synchronous interaction with the therapist, as in a telephone call, instant messaging, uh, video conferencing, or uh, some type of screen sharing, uh, as we're doing now. Uh, they're also self-guided programs. These are web-based training programs that are asynchronous. Somebody can log into a particular program and walk through uh, the program themselves and uh, perhaps answer questions or take homework assignments and so on, but there is no therapist interaction. And then there are telerehabilitation interventions that are hybrid. They have a combination of self-guided parts, components, as well as therapist facilitated components. I want to talk to you a little bit more about video conference, which is something that maybe three months ago a lot of people didn't know much about or knew about but hadn't used very very frequently uh, and now we're all in this in this world of video conferencing and uh, for in many places in the country that's the only way we can actually interact with one another so what is video conferencing it's the simultaneous synchronous audiovisual interaction between a therapist and a patient uh, and while in the past some studies from uh, the uh, 90s or even further before, they had been using they had been using clunky specialized equipment to deli deliver such interventions. 
but now we have several commercially available applications uh, that people use in their personal life, Skype, for example, or Google Meets, among others, uh, that make video conferencing a much more uh, a much easier practice. Studies in non-TBI samples uh, are abundant in terms of uh, using video conference for telerehabilitation. Um, and in TBI samples, more and more, again, the literature has been uh, more prolific in the more, in more recent years uh, using video conference as, a, as an intervention. But we had a challenge. Our interventions that came out of the day treatment program tradition were group interventions. And the question we needed to ask ourselves is, can we maintain the benefits of group dynamics? Can we uh, create an environment where the same benefits that groups offer to a group of people with brain injury who come together still exist? Uh, so we looked at the literature and at the time when that was back in 2012, we only found two studies that described remote uh, group treatments in non-TBI samples. Uh, one was an anger management study that was really not a, uh, a synchronous study because it required patients to be in one room at the clinic and the therapist somewhere else in his or her office. But that defeats the purpose of access to treatment if the patients have to come to the clinic. The other study, the substance use, was using a model where the therapist was interacting with multiple participants at the same time online, but the participants couldn't see or interact with one another. So there goes the uh, benefit of being in a group. So back then, in the TBI literature, video, group video conferencing was uncharted territory. The other challenge that we had was that our interventions are complex. And when I say complex, I don't mean complicated. I mean that they have certain process that needs to be learned and needs to be practiced. Uh, and it may have been difficult for us to deliver it remotely. And also we were using swaps and MREG as complementary interventions. And we were wondering, can we uncouple them? Can we separate them and deliver, and deliver each one of them as an individual standalone treatment? So what we did in 2012 is we chose MREG to test it out to see if it is an intervention, one of the complex interventions that can be delivered online. And we created online MREG, an online version of our emotion regulation intervention. Before I go into uh, some of the steps that we took with the technology, I want to tell you a little bit more about emotion regulation because the two aspects of executive function that we have been targeting, problem solving and emotional regulation, I think more people are familiar with problem solving and interventions with problem solving than emotion regulation. So I'd just like to bring all of us on the same page. So what is emotion regulation? Emotion regulation is the ability to monitor, evaluate, and modify an emotional response. That means that uh, I am able to be aware of whether I have an emotional reaction right now. I'm able to evaluate whether this emotional reaction is preventing me or promoting me from engaging in goal-directed behavior. And I can modify that emotional reaction accordingly based on situational demands or based on personal goals. In our intervention, we make it clear what we do not consider emotion regulation, and I want to share that with you as well. We don't consider emotion regulation things like anger management or stress management or agitation or irritability uh, treatments because those are very narrow in scope. They target one type of emotion, let's say, or one type of behavioral reaction, and emotion regulation is above and beyond that. Emotion regulation is the ability to manage our emotional machinery, our emotional system with more efficiency and more um, uh, facility. Also, emotional regulation is not behavioral modification where we use uh, reinforcement or contingency plans to target a specific behavior. Similarly, emotional regulation doesn't mean that we have to 
not feel anything or be cool, calm, and collected all the time. That type of emotional muting that often participants who approach us and want to take part in our studies uh, worry that we will turn them into robots. No, that's not emotion regulation. It's not a stifling or muting of the emotional experience. And it's also not purely an emotional support intervention where we sit around and we talk about how we feel and you know we pat each other in the back. It's beyond that. It's a skill. It's a cognitive skill, in fact, that has uh, that lear the learning of has many implications uh, for for executive functioning and and uh, uh, positive outcomes in different areas of life. Now, why is it important for us to consider including emotion regulation training after brain injury? Well, first, because brain injury itself can cause disruption in emotion regulation systems. Uh, the neurological damage itself can disrupt networks or systems or structures or uh, connections that are implicated in emotion regulation. Uh, but also the psychological impact of a brain injury, whether the trauma itself uh, or the, the long-term losses that people experience can cause a disruption in our emotion regulation systems. In and of itself, it's a distressing symptom. Not being able to diffuse negative affect is something that um, most people would find, uh, would find unpleasant and uncomfortable and would want to change. It leads to maladaptive behaviors. Those behaviors can range from the uh, amotivational, adynamic, abulic type, all the way to the disinhibited and impulsive and compulsive type. Not being able to manage one's behavior or to manage one's affect can then lead to a negative self-appraisal and have a, a strong impact on somebody's belief in their ability to uh, to be and to perform in their day-to-day -day life. It does have an impact on the other executive functions. As I mentioned, we come from the approach that emotion regulation is an aspect of executive function and it interferes with problem solving, with reasoning, uh, with response selection, as well as in and of itself, emotional awareness, social cognition, emotional communication, which are considered aspects of executive function, are also uh, thwarted by emotion dysregulation. It can also have an impact on treatment. It can affect attendance and participation in treatment. So people who have uh, extreme states of negative affect may not be motivated or may not have the energy to come to the treatment center. It can affect engagement uh, and report building with uh, the providers. Um, and it can also, it uses up resources, mental resources that could be used, could be placed onto other types of training. So for example, if somebody has chronic feelings of dejection, let's say, or lack of motivation, then we cannot really engage them in high intensity cognitive training for attention because they are preoccupied with their negative feelings and negative thoughts. And lastly, we know in the literature that positive affect, feeling positively, positive emotions have a beneficial effect on not just mental health, but also physical health. And having lost the ability to manage our affect and not being able to generate positive states is a missed opportunity for improving uh, mental and physical health. So for these reasons, we think that it's important to include uh, emotion regulation as a component of executive function treatment uh, after brain injury. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about our particular intervention, MREG, our training in emotional regulation skills, uh, to demonstrate how we approach it and let you decide if it's uh, complex or not. But in the two minutes, I'm not going to do it uh, a lot of justice. So I apologize ahead of time for that. So we inform, we have used a variety of theories and, and uh, research to build the background, the backbone of the, of the intervention of MREG and to create subsequently the materials that we use in order to um, provide the training and to uh, improve emotion regulation. Our objectives with MREG are 
to help people become more aware of all the components of an emotional experience. And by that, I mean that we often think of an emotion as a separate thing from a thought, and that's a separate thing from a behavior. But what we are doing is we're training them to look at this as a, as a global experience that incorporates thoughts and behaviors and somatic reactions and uh, environmental triggers because all of that is part of any emotional experience. So we teach them a framework in which to understand what an emotional experience is. Uh, subsequently, our second goal, our second objective is to help them be able to monitor and evaluate their emotional experiences. So to be able to understand when they're having an emotional reaction and what that emotional reaction is doing, how is it affecting their thinking patterns, how is it inter uh, interfering with the goal-directed behavior. And lastly, uh, we focus on regulation, self-regulation. How, uh, what strategies are, are, are there available to be able to modify the emotional experience? And notice I keep using the term emotional experience intentionally and not just emotion, because as we all know, as, as a lot of us know from psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy, often shifting um, a thinking pattern uh, is going to have a beneficial effect on our emotional, subjective emotional experience as well. So those are our objectives with MREC, and this is what we start with at the onset of the training with our participants. How have we, how have we have designed MREG is that it has didactic and experiential components. It's a module of treatment, and each module has a component that is didactic, where we teach people concepts, new language, frameworks, and there's an experiential component where we have them practice. So for example, if I'm teaching somebody about uh, the, the origins of an emotion, what an emotion is, how to assess affect, then there will be homework assigned where they will have to practice this um, technique of awareness or of regulation on their own. We have a clinician's manual that we have compiled over the last few years of research and a participant workbook, which is used extensively in our, uh, in, our, in our training. So the participants have a workbook that they follow and we follow the, uh, that follows the format of the intervention. The MREG is also individualized and contextualized. And what I mean by that is that we ask people to set personal goals. So we have our own goal as researchers and as clinicians, we want people's emotional regulation abilities to improve, but we also want them to bring in some of their own goals, personal goals, to make it more meaningful to them. So those goals can be something like, I want to be calmer when I have a conversation with my boss, or I don't want to be snapping at my spouse as often, or when I'm uh, frustrated about something, I want to be able to calm down faster and, and deal with it more effectively. And uh, the contextualized part here means that we don't use canned examples or stories, you know, that have been developed to elicit emotion or clips from movies. We use people's personal experiences. So we take their own uh, experiences, their own uh, anecdotes, and we work with them. And we have been delivering it, as I mentioned, our research has been group-based, but we also have been using it individually in our own sessions with our own clients with, with great success. The tool that we use to organize all this information is this diagram. This diagram we call the emotional cycle, and you may see it uh, in subsequent slides, but uh, I'm not going to tell you more about it because, again, this is a very complex intervention and there are many different pieces, but this is the mantra, if you will, or the step-by-step uh, -step process, and we use it in a visual format because some people have an easier time to remember it, and then we can add all the verbal content around it. So, what we, the question for us was, can we take this existing intervention and modify it for online delivery? This is a complex intervention, as you can imagine, with different moving pieces and different things to learn and things to practice. So, yeah, we thought, let's give it a try and see what happens. So, what did we have to do? Well, first, we had to choose a platform. And our platform had to be chosen based on its uh, availability 
is it easy for people to access or do we have to go install big boxes with uh, cameras in their homes and have some kind of special cable that goes to their telephone jack? So we were looking for things that are available. Um, what about their usability? Are they user friendly for both the clinician and for the uh, participant or the patient? Can we learn how to use them and use all their functionalities? And as an end user, does a patient feel like, okay, this is something that I can easily log into and turn on my microphone and turn off my camera if I need to and so on. Um, the third component was, does it create the virtual experience that we need it? Does it meet the demands of a group intervention? Um, and Along with that, so we were looking to see what are some elements of uh, groups that, that work and can we reproduce them here. And of course, security is last but not least. Um, does the software that we use provide uh, passwords for entry, secure end-to-end uh, -end encryption, is it HIPAA compliant, and so on and so forth. So at the time, we chose GoToMeeting. And you see here, these are uh, the team members, the uh, research team members, from 2013. Uh, I know you can't see me on camera today, but here's a snapshot of me somewhere like fourth from the left. Um, and this was 2013, so I don't look like that still. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a also a screen share of the emotional cycle. You see the emotional cycle that I talked to you about earlier. So we chose good meeting. Next, we had to modify the intervention. So we have a workbook. How do we make that available to participants who are going to work with us remotely? Well, easy. We create a PDF file and we email it to them. Or for those who prefer to have a physical copy and they do not have access to a printer, we can print a copy and send it to them by mail. In our face-to-face -face interventions, we use a whiteboard consistently. We use it to uh, recreate the emotional cycle and to put information on and then we draw arrows and we uh, make circles and it's a very uh, visual way of organizing the information. Well, how can we do that online? We have, because of the screen share feature, what we can do is we can use um, a PowerPoint slide to type things on or write things on. Also, some software have virtual boards that we can use and use it in a similar way that we use our whiteboard in the office, in the clinic. And we deal with homework. People have homework assigned and sometimes they bring it in and they give it to us and we look at it and sometimes we go over it in class. Well, we deal with it the same way. If we need to go over it in class, then we will discuss it in class. They will be at their own spaces and we will be in our own. Or if it's something that we will look at at a later time, they can email it to us so that we make sure that the homework has been completed. Now, because this was a research project, we also wanted to know if we can save participants from having to come into our clinic or into the, uh, the research center in order to take the surveys that we have delivered. So we figured out a way to, to protect anybody from having to come into to the uh, research center and we sent them links to online surveys that they could fill in at home and we would get the results and do all the compiling and data analysis at a later point. The other thing that's very important, if you think about how a, the experience of going to a treatment center for an intervention, a group intervention, entails certain steps that they're intuitive. I go to the clinic, I speak to the front desk staff, I go to the waiting room, I may pick up a magazine, uh, I may talk to somebody else in the waiting room, somebody that I know or somebody that I don't know. I may say hello to another clinician that I know in the set, in the facility. So how do we create this kind of experience? We need to create a different kind of procedure now to um, make that happen. So we create a new procedure for what new procedures for what happens before the meeting in terms of. Do we send out reminders? Do we open the meeting sooner that people can come in and chit-chat a little bit with one another? Um, but what happens during the meeting? People don't have their favorite seat to take that's away from the AC or close to the board. So um, how, do we, how do we interact with them during the meeting? Uh, therefore, we needed to create a new set of rules of conduct and comportment, which we call netiquette. 
and how we deal with issues that require technical assistance during the intervention. So we had to set up procedures for that as well. And then after the meeting, what kind of follow-up do we have? So if you think about it again, if you think of a physical space, when people leave, they can stop and say, hey, Theo, can I ask you a question? This concept here, oh, it's really important because when I go outside and my dog is, uh, uh, you know, very playful, I get really scared that I'm not going to be able to manage the dog. So these kinds of opportunities are a miss. How can we create a process that we become available? Um, the other thing that I think we have more control over in, in a virtual environment and less so in a physical environment is how much interaction there is between the participants. Uh, when participants leave our space of, in, a, in a clinic setting, they can hang out if they want to, they can exchange numbers, they can be friends. Uh, in the virtual world, we have a responsibility to protect each other's privacy and therefore we have to be thinking more carefully about how do we make, is how do we not make connections happen, but how do we protect unwanted connections from happening? Um, I have a link down there from uh, the University of Washington where Don Ely is doing a very similar intervention in, in its format, for, like the one we're doing, but for people with multiple sclerosis and uh, it's a mindfulness training intervention. But they have created a really uh, very detailed uh, procedural uh, manual of things to think about when you're delivering a telehealth intervention. So we learned that yes, we can translate our complex intervention, but can individuals with brain injury participate in this kind of telerehabilitation program? We did a feasibility study in 2012. And our questions were, can we deliver MREG remotely using video conference? And an additional, additional questions included, can they participate? Are they able to engage in treatment? Can they complete the outcome measures online? Do they report satisfaction with treatment delivery? Uh, again, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the results, but I wanted to summarize and say that participants overall had great attendance, they had great participation, um, I can come back to these slides at a later time if you have more questions, uh, but they were giving us confidence that participants were able to be in a group and be in, in treatment. It's a small scale study, feasibility. Um, they were able to complete outcome measures as well. And the 82.6% there may sound small to you, but considering that they were receiving, um, they're receiving surveys twice, uh, sorry, every other week for 24 weeks, that is pretty remarkable that we got so many surveys back. Some people aced it as well. They got 100% of the surveys completed. And were they satisfied with the treatment? Um, we gave them a, a measure that uh, assesses satisfaction with therapy and the therapist. And with a high score of six, we got 5.3 and 5.1. So to answer our question, can we deliver a group intervention remotely? The answer is yes, we can deliver a group intervention remotely, but we didn't see any movement on our emotion regulation measure. So while people can come in and participate and be in a group and have fun, there were no changes in the main outcome measure. So what does that mean? What do we have to do? Well, there's a variety of reasons, and in our publication, we explain why we didn't find any changes in emotional regulation, but the right thing to do then is to do another study. So in 2012, again, we received funding, and we wanted to see if people with brain injury can benefit from the rehabilitation, tele-rehabilitation intervention. So is it just that they can participate and they can have fun, and it's like an emotional support group, or do they get the real benefit? So our efficacy study uh, lasted, uh, went, went by very, very quickly because of the uh, ability to recruit very fast. Um, and our main hypothesis here was whether people are able to report improvement in emotion regulation as measured by a main, main outcome measure. There's another research question that, among the many that we had, that has to do with 
uh, their own participants' subjective assessment of their own treatment progress that I would like to share with you a little bit. So the main hypothesis, does uh, online MREG lead to significant changes in emotion regulation? Yes. Uh, we use the difficulties in emotion regulation scale as our main outcome measure, and the higher the score on the DERS, the more emotional dysregulation is present. So we hope to see a reduction over time, and here you see the average scores pre-treatment and then post-treatment and, and uh, at the 12-week at the follow-up as well. The treatment was uh, 20, 12, uh, 12 weeks long, and then the follow-up was another 12 weeks long. So we got significant, significant results with a um, high effect size. Um, so we felt that yes, this intervention does benefit, but do they feel that way? The answer is yes. Here is where we ask people to assess the progress that they were making on their own goals. Remember I told you that we asked people to set individual goals? We asked them to set three to five goals and then track their progress on these goals from the beginning to the end of treatment. And at the end of treatment, there was a significant uh, uh, assessment of improvement on their uh, behalf as well. This is another way of measuring change at the transition rating scale, where we ask people if they experienced any change, if they feel any better from the beginning to the end of treatment. We ask that at the end of treatment only. So the categories there are no change, hardly any better, a little better, somewhat better, mildly better, good deal better, great deal better, and very great deal better. And we were um, happy to see that 50% of our participants reported that they were a great deal better or higher than they started. That's their own assessment. Now, currently, we're in the process of conducting a second version of the online Emmerich study. The first one was a pre-post within subject design. This one is a randomized uh, a control trial with a waitlist design and we are recruiting and because the study is ongoing and you may have uh, an interest in uh, uh, informing people that you know that, that the study exists and they can participate I just like to briefly go over our eligibility criteria uh, this is a study that's limited to people with uh, traumatic brain injuries because it's funded by the TBI model systems uh, they have to be six months post-injury, adults 18 years or older. They must have deficits in emotional regulation, otherwise there's no point in recruiting them for a, a, a intervention that's going to help them improve their emotional regulation skills. They have to be English speaking, have adequate communication skills because this is a very highly interactive group, and they need to have access uh, and the ability to use the internet a computer, a tablet, a smartphone with a camera and microphone, any of these devices, active email address and access to high-speed broadband because this is how we are going to stay in touch. Exclusion criteria include active suicidal ideation, active psychosis and active substance abuse. So, so far, as I mentioned earlier, the lessons that we learned was that were that people with brain injury need access to treatment. Second lesson was that we can give them access to treatment using technology. The third one is that we can translate complex interventions, even complex interventions, into telerehabilitation interventions. The fourth one was that people can participate in telerehabilitation interventions, people with brain injury. And the fifth one was that not only can they participate, but they can also benefit from it. Now, the sixth lesson here indicates that telerehabilitation is not the same as face-to-face -face rehabilitation. And my personal view on that is that it's a waste of time to ask if they are the same or if they are different. Um, they are different entities and we cannot say, well, you know, I, it's a personal preference to say, well, I prefer face-to-face -face than virtual. Sure, I get that. But if we have to compare the two, uh, it's not it's not a fair comparison. Uh, this interaction that we're having today, uh, I you, know, you are attending a webinar. Uh, you can see me, you can see my slides, you can hear my voice. It would be a very different experience if we were uh, in Atlanta at the conference and I was there live. You would have a different experience for sure. That doesn't mean, however, that this webinar is not valuable 
or it's not useful or helpful or, or even unhelpful, you know, you, you can be a judge of that, but it's a different experience. So that doesn't mean that it's not good, it's not valuable, uh, and we shouldn't um, consider it or we should compare it to face-to-face. -face. I think that if we are creating tele-rehabilitation interventions from scratch or if we are modifying existing ones, we need to test them and see whether they are valuable on their own merit. So what we need to do, as I mentioned before, we establish different procedures, we establish different codes of conduct. In our last study, the one that was completed in 2016 and we published in 2017, we asked, we did extensive exit interviews with each participant. We had 81 participants. And we asked them if they found online MREG helpful. 98.5% said yes, they found it helpful. We asked them what they like about it. And they said it was a, so this is summary, this is a content analysis summary. They said, good learning experience, connection with other people, and uh, it was convenient not having to leave the home. We also liked to ask them, what did you not like about online MREG? And about 50% of the people said, there's nothing I can think of that I didn't like about, it, which is you know great for us to hear, it, it strokes our ego. Uh, but um, some people mentioned that the technical difficulties were a challenge and the group dynamics were not the same. And I'd like to uh, present you now with some quotes that we got from these interviews just to see how people's experience, uh, what people's experience was during their journey with online Emory. Overall, it was really good. Even though I never met the people, everyone was able to develop a bond over their shared experiences with TBI. It's good to hear other people's point of view. It's been a lonely journey these past years. So this speaks to the social, social aspect and the connection that people experience. Uh, somebody else said, my husband even said to me, I can't believe how excited you get to do this. So this speaks to how much pleasure they feel participating and, and learning things. And someone else said, I, I identified with everything that was said, especially the emotional control, what the study was designed for, emotion regulation. So there's this aspect of learning as well that people were able to glean something that they found helpful for themselves. Of course, there's also the other side, and I don't want to be unfairly presenting just the positive quotes. Here are some other quotes. One person felt it was too short. Uh, it seemed like we just got started. So we got feedback that the intervention wasn't long enough, even though it was consisted of 24 sessions over 12 weeks. It takes some time for participants to get and feel, sorry, to gel and feel comfortable with each other. That's true. And we don't know how that would be in a face-to-face -face interaction. But again, we don't, we don't, as I said before, we can't compare the two. Uh, the facilitators need to be concerned about taming those who are verbose, right? So here we lack the nonverbal cues that we can give to somebody that their time is up. How do you do it when you are on a two-dimensional flat screen and you cannot just move your body in certain ways that indicate now it's time for you to let somebody else speak? Uh, somebody said that it was hard to keep track of multiple people on the screen. That it was hard for me to process. And I want to say that there's this assumption that I often hear at conferences that, oh, this um, uh, this must be very confusing or complicated for people with brain injury. And, you know, it may be for some, but for most, it's not. It's not a complaint that we hear often. But the um, making this assumption is going to prevent us from creating new ways of reaching, reaching people. Um, somebody else said, I wish there was a way to hide my own screen so that I could focus on others. And I know we all get distracted by our own image when we are on a conference call and a Zoom call, and technology allows us now to hide ourselves so that we don't get distracted by our own uh, beauty like Narcissus and uh, miss everything else that's going on. The next lesson that we learned is that the same principles that we use in face-to-face -face, uh, treatments can also facilitate treatment outcomes in virtual environments. So in our in our swaps and MREG interventions, the things that we consider factors that facilitate skill building, the fact that it's a highly structured intervention, uh, that it uh, has a flexible approach, that it requires repeated practice, that it requires contextualization, that it's important to embed generalization, that modeling by clinicians, bringing clinicians into the mix and sharing their own examples, and involving others, 
are also the same factors that promote skill building in the virtual version. The next lesson we learned is that familiarity and flexibility with existing technologies facilitates treatment. This goes without saying, the better you are at handling the technology on your end, the, the easier you will make it for people to follow because you won't get lost, you won't be stuck in like, how do I do this, how do I do that? But also sometimes, if what you're using doesn't work, if the method, the platform you're using doesn't work, you can switch. So while we started GoToMeeting, and I know this webinar is in GoToMeeting, sorry GoToMeeting, we actually switched to Zoom. See, you see here the 20, uh, the 2020 team, and uh, here is our moderator, Dr. Kazankova, uh, and myself again. Uh, we switched to Zoom and we um, did it a very, you know, we did the same thing in a, in a different platform. Uh, next lesson, train the trainer. We are able not only to use tele rehabilitation to, um, to deliver the treatment of the participants, but to also train other providers. And we did that uh, through another grant that we received from the CDC, where we provided training in SWAPS and MREG to uh, four facilities, three of which we did online. And it was a very good experience, even though my colleague, Teresa Ashman and I, who did the training, we were initially scared how we're gonna teach somebody this complex intervention, which we do in person in, in eight hour, 12 hour, 16 hour workshops, how do we do it online? And we were able to do it. So this frees us up again, frees up resources and increases access, not only to patients, but also to providers. Now, to be fair, there are still many unknowns regarding treatment outcomes and briefly, um, we still, there are some lessons that we still haven't learned. We don't know who benefits from online treatments. We don't know who doesn't. We don't know if it creates a different access problem. So do people who not, do not have high speed internet access or don't have laptops or do not have phones or computers, uh, does that mean that they are now excluded from access to treatment? Are there risks? Uh, and the risks, I don't just mean security risks, but does it make somebody less likely to go outside and to interact with people in, in, in real time? Um, another big question that we often hear, is it reimbursable? Clearly in the last two months, things have changed a lot in that arena and insurance companies have been more amenable to and open to teletreatments, but we don't know if that's going to be sustained. And the last thing I wanted to say about that is that technology moves faster than publishing. Notice that uh, I told you that our study took, was a five-year trial, right? So from 2012 to 2017, a lot of things can happen technologically, but from the time we start to the time we finish our study and then we analyze the data and then we publish the results, it can be up to seven years. So we have to be on the lookout for not just studies that have been published, but studies that are ongoing and, and learn from each other and see what we can do better. Um, and uh, move, uh, move the rehabilitation field into the future that way as well. Um, as a last note, I wanted to go back to the slide that I showed you earlier, which indicated our catchment area. So that circle indicates the people we were able to capture with our Executive Plus intervention, right? The people who were within an hour and a half from New York City. This is the, not the uh, extent of reach that we had with our online app. We were able to reach people from 33 states. So um, definitely a benefit to people with brain injury to increase access to treatment. Now, I know I didn't leave you a lot of time for questions and I'm sorry, it was very hard to parse down uh, over 15 years of research into uh, short webinar like that, but I want you to get the full picture as well as what we have learned in this process. Uh, we do have some time for questions and also if there are questions that you have that we won't be able to answer in the next five minutes, we will be happy to reach out to you uh, in other ways and uh, answer your questions. So I'm um, going to go back to my clear moderator, Dr. Kazankova, and ask if there are any questions that uh, we have. Yes, um, so thank you, Dr. Sassidis, for your wonderful presentation. Um, we have one question so far, and I encourage you all to type any questions you may have into the chat. So 
Dr. Salcides has a chance to answer them for you real, real time. Um, I'll start with the first question. Um, have you ever delivered this intervention to a group that was partial, partially virtual and online so that some members were present and others participated online? If so, could you share a little bit about this? If not, do you have any op uh, opinions about this idea? I'm hearing people talk about this as a possible service delivery method in some brain injury outpatient clinics in order to meet social distancing needs. Hmm, an interesting question that I never thought of as a research design. And being, um, you know, a, a researcher by nature, I would say it's an empirical question. As a practitioner, though, I would say that it muddies the water because if you have, and if I'm understanding the question correctly, is can you have a group? of let's say six people where three people are online and three people are face to face. Um, I wouldn't be in favor of that because you're kind of mixing two different experiences for a group that needs to have a similar experience um, and will be questioning, you know, the people in the office would be questioning, why do I have to drag myself out in the snow and come here? Whereas the people online would be saying, oh, I wish I could hang out with them and then we could go grab coffee afterwards. I'm not sure how that would play out in terms of group dynamics. I also think that the logistics of it would be more challenging, more difficult. We do that a lot for our, our meetings, you know, like our uh, research meetings or conference meetings, but those are, those are one-time events, and I think that uh, they, you know, they, they are different of different nature. So, while I don't have an empirical answer to give uh, as a practitioner, I would it would not be my preference because, like I said, there are two different things. So mixing them together may make things more complicated for both patients and providers. So then, there's a follow-up question. If you have nothing else to add. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that just as with in-person groups, the social communication deficits that can occur after TBI sometimes may interfere with the group effectiveness. Are there any tips helpful for managing this in virtual group session, aside from what might typically be done during in-person group therapy? Um, yes. Uh, the, the encouragement that this is a way of communicating that some people may not be familiar with, that it takes time to warm up, that we have to be more patient with people because uh, they're not familiar. Um, I think all of these things are part of how to facilitate social communication, using the rules of conduct, using an etiquette, and reminding people that this is what we do, this is how we are. Um, reminding people ahead of time to be focused on this particular um, activity right now and not do anything else. Uh, I think that those are the methods we have used. We do also have a vetting process where if people have significant speech or communication problems, we, we wouldn't recommend this type of treatment because it is the kind of treatment that by, by nature of the treatment, even in face-to-face -face versions, requires a lot of verbal interaction, a lot of uh, Q&A, a lot of um, uh, sharing of personal experiences. So um, okay, I, I, I have, hope that, yeah. There's one more question maybe we have, mm -hmm. we have time for in the mm -hmm. last minute. Um, what have been some of the biggest challenges in delivering the MREG intervention online to individuals with brain injury? Oh, what have been some of the biggest challenges? Um, I think that from our perspective, the technology has been the biggest challenge, especially with people who don't have the required devices or the appropriate space where they can be in privacy and isolate themselves and have a, a you know that, that experience without exposing other people's privacy in public spaces etc so convincing people that a they need the appropriate device and b they need the appropriate space has been a challenge uh, I, and, and maria if you have anything that you wanted to add 
please feel free. No, I think those are some of the biggest ones. There's some of the access and the space, yeah. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Tzalcides for sharing your expertise and thank you all for attending the webinar. I encourage you to join ACRM and its community group, such as the Technology Networking Group and the BII SIG. Um, all of the um, recording of, 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 the, of the webinars will be available in the next 24 hours. So please recommend this webinar to your colleagues and re, uh, repost via your social media circles. I wish you all well and I hope you will join us for the next webinar.